Right. You kind of want to go at them as like a fun, creative thing rather than like, well, I don't want to be in the real world, so I'm going to take something. Um, a lot of the time, you end up kind of, as you're writing songs, you'll finish like a verse and be like, is this good? And you're like, well, you don't know. You, you, you know, you've just started it. But um, for me, a, a big part of it is just kind of getting out of my own head. Whenever I'm trying to write good music is usually when I write the worst music, or at least my least favorite music. Um, I feel I feel like sometimes, like you'll write something and you'll either go, "Is this good enough?" or you get like a chorus that you think is really good, and then you're like scared of ruining it by writing like a bad verse or something mm. yeah i think it's kind of like you know if there's a song you don't like or something you don't like in your head even if it's like a subconscious thing you can kind of be like yeah well that wasn't really my choice or that that kind of thing and then um yeah i mean it's definitely putting obviously more of yourself out there um but i kind of that's kind of what's exciting for me a big part of it was like when i first came out of the band i think i kept thinking like oh i don't want to make fun music and a lot of that was a subconscious thing i just didn't really want to make like the sa i just didn't want to make the same music that we we're making in the band not because i didn't like it i just didn't want i just didn't i just wanted it to be a different thing um i mean i feel like i feel like it's not uh i, I mean i got really lucky first of all with with you know, and a lot of people, obviously, there's a lot of, like, arguments where people are like, oh, I hate my label, and uh, everything's the, anything that goes wrong is, like, their fault and that kind of thing. And I have to say, like, um, Rob, who kind of runs my label, uh, he signed me, and he signed us in the band as well, so I, I've been with them for a while, but when I signed um, on my own, I kind of said, I called him and just said, like, I kind of need to go and like figure this out a little bit and I don't want I really I'm not going to be able to do it if you're like breathing down my neck basically and um and he was amazing about it he just said like I want to hear it when you're excited to play it to me and when you're ready I'll hear it so he came when the album was basically finished and I think he was shitting himself quite a bit and uh he said the first like four songs he felt like he was drowning because he just didn't know you know he didn't know what he was expecting well she was no it kind of happened a little more um randomly than that it was because i'd never really played her stuff before um and she was in london there was some fleetwood mac shows in london and uh she wakes up pretty late and she wanted to go to dinner one of the nights so i took her to this little indian restaurant near my house um and then so I just kind of finished the record, and then she said, oh, I want to come hear the album. And she was with, like, all her ladies. And I played them the album. And they're so used to, like, living nocturnally. They, You know, they wake up really late, and then they kind of live through the night because they're, you know, witches. 3 a.m. Playing, <laughs> playing the album, I'm like, I'm kind of tired. And they're, like, right in their prime. You know, they're really like, oh, this is, like, daytime for us. I'm exhausted. Well, I think the thing is, is obviously you hope she doesn't say that. But the the biggest kind of advice she's always given me is to just do what I want to do. So there's a couple of bits where, like, she thought the first single was wrong and she thought a song that didn't go on the album should have gone on the album. You know, I was like, okay. Uh, I, I definitely thought about it. Um, but... Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like the whole point is to just do, okay, well, if I wanted it this way and then she told me to change it and I didn't, I must really want it this way. Yeah, and I think, I think I've always noticed with, like, decisions I've made, when I start asking too many people, it's usually because I don't want to do it and I'm waiting for somebody to tell me not to do it. Um, I did... I don't really know. I basically... I was at home... Uh, and I used to hate, like, people looking me in the eyes while I was singing. So I had, I basically had, like, three songs that I was thinking about doing. And uh, I went in the bathroom in my house. I was living with my mum and my sister. And I made them stand on the other side of the door of the bathroom. 
So I sang the three songs. I was like, which one do you think I should do? And then they said that one. So I I did Isn't She Lovely through all of the like earlier um, auditions before you get on the TV show. Um, so we did like a Battle of the Bands competition, 10 hours of studio time or something. One of them is still doing the band. Um, and then one guy moved to, he went to Italy. Um, I'm in touch with, I speak to one of them a little bit, and I, I've spoken to another one kind of um, recently-ish, but not, not super recently, and then kind of lost touch with the other one. It was called Winter. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a big part of it is what you want to get from it. I think if you're looking for, if you're looking for like fulfillment in music and you want to like take songs and be like a massive pop star and just have people write the songs for you and sing them, then you'd think the goal is so that it's more successful. So then, then I just think you're measuring yourself on like the being successful part of, of music, which which is fine and it's amazing and it works for a lot of people. I, I don't know. But then that's the only thing you're ever measuring it by. I feel like, I mean, to be fair, they did know better than us because, like, when we started, I was 16. Um, so I also, it, everything was so new and exciting and you're suddenly working with these big producers and big people and, like, I never would have been confident enough to be like, actually, guys, I'm going to write a song on this first album. So it was basically like the first album was pretty much done, kind of, you know, writers and stuff. Okay, we're going to do this song, and these guys have written this song, what do you think, and that kind of thing. I didn't know what really was going on. It was kind of like, Ugh. it was all it was all new, and I had no idea. I didn't, I didn't go on the show thinking I was going to win. I didn't, my mum actually entered me in to go, and... Um, and we we used to watch it as a family, and we were watching it one time, and somebody finished a performance, and I just said, like, oh, it looks like so much fun. And then I went upstairs, and then a couple of months later, my mom was like, oh, you have an audition on Sunday. Um, I was, I was okay. I was a little scared, but it was the first round of auditions was at Old Trafford, which is where Man United play, and I was a massive Man United fan, so I was like, all right. It's kind of... Uh, yeah, it was it. It's kind of like one of those just out of body things because it was so it's so so far out of my comfort zone. Like all I did was school and I worked in a bakery after school and that was like my whole. Um, I was okay. No, not really. It's kind of one of those where like I had dinner recently with this girl that I went to school with and uh, a couple friends and one of them was my manager was there and they met and and he was like. Was he, was he the same in school? And she was like, yes and no. You know, s s similar in a lot of ways and not very similar at all in some ways. I had a little more uh, timber on me back then as well. I was working in a in a bakery. Yeah, it wasn't great for the... Also, like, when you're kind of 14, 15, you get, you got that bit of, like, puppy fat going on, so... Um, yeah, he's, he's amazing. Uh, he was like... The guy when we were on the show, like when we were on the show on X Factor, everybody was like, that guy is so fucking good. Like his voice was amazing. He was a great, he's just like a very talented musician. It's one of those things where like it definitely makes, like I think about it all the time. And, and it kind of, I guess just reminds me how lucky I am to be doing it because I know there's, you know, hundreds of thousands if not millions of musicians who are so far superior to me as a musician um and not everyone gets to do it it's like one of those things where i do think a lot of this stuff is about luck and i do think i do believe like some people make their own luck but i also think so much of it is just about luck and timing because when i look at it there's no reason there's no reason for it to have been me who got to do this for, I mean, yes, talking to him is so fulfilling for so many reasons. Obviously, he's one of the greatest songwriters of all time. Um, and has just, like, been through, you'd imagine, pretty much everything in terms of what that all kind of entails. And and also, he's he's so... 
it's kind of what I was saying earlier, like if you're somebody who's just taking the big songs to try and have a hit, at some point you don't have a hit, and then how do you feel when you don't kind of hit that? And he's someone who clearly just loves music and has never lost kind of gaining something from making albums and writing songs and stuff. And I went to watch him at the O2 um, last December, and, uh, like, he plays for three hours, and you're like, he doesn't have to play for three hours. He clearly just loves it. You look at kind of all, like, the rockers and all those older guys, you're like, who ultimately do you want to be at the end of the day? Do You, you don't want to be the guy who died. You don't want to be the guy who's, like, whacked out on drugs. You want to be the guy who's, you know, 70 and playing for three hours because he can and because he wants to, and everyone's loving it, and he's having fun. Yeah, I find it super inspiring, that show, actually. He's, he's you know, he's incredible. Mm, right. Mm-hmm. New York's just like a little much for me. I run in New York, which I like. It actually has made me enjoy the city a lot more. Um, I mean, I think it's one of those things, because, uh, you know, every two people you speak to, one of them says it's really scary, and the other person says it's not that scary. Um, I think it's, like, about... I mean, I don't know. It's It's... It's one of those things where, like, it's kind of like the simple stuff. You, like, wash your hands all the time and don't, you know, I, I, I don't really know. It's kind of one of those things where, like, the traveling thing is hard. You don't really know how it's going to affect that stuff. But then but then the touring's like, not the most important thing. You know, like, my tour isn't the most important thing. If But did you see the, um, you know, the Dean Koontz book? I think it's The Eyes of Darkness. Did you see the, the pages in there? Somebody texted me these pages from The Eyes of Darkness, and it's basically like predicting the whole thing. It's crazy. Yeah. It says that, like, uh, around 2020, a pneumonia like virus will sweep through the world. Uh, there'll be no, there'll be no, um, like, known treatment. It will come back 10 years later and then disappear. And in the book, the, the name of the strain is called Wuhan 400, you know. But, uh, um, there's this girl Madison Cunningham um, she's amazing uh, she's gonna come actually we're playing a show at Madison Square Garden for Halloween mm-hmm. Harry Ween she's gonna come uh, play with us there um, she's great she's really cool no I had like a, my, a hood up and a big jacket on a hat on and everything it was pretty cold and um, and I turned my music off because I was listening to some music and uh, I'm walking up and I kind of see this group of and this group of guys, they've all got, like, hoods up and their faces covered and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's a bit weird. And I'm walking up the street, and uh, and I keep kind of turning around, and the guys cross the road, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's weird, you know. And, uh, and then I'm walking up, and I hear, like, there was, like, gravel on the pavement, so I hear, like, shuffling of feet trying to, like, catch up to me. So I cross the street, and then they cross the street, and I'm like, oh, fuck's sake. And then I'm walking up, And I hear, like, there was, like, gravel on the pavement. So I hear, like, shuffling of feet trying to, like, catch up to me. So I cross the street. And then I cross the street again. And then they cross the street again. And I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. I think I'm about to get robbed. So um, so the guy's like, hey, can we talk to you for a minute? And there's nobody around. So I'm like, um, so I'm like, sure. And uh, he's like, do you smoke weed? And I said, no. And he goes, do you want some weed? And I thought, no. Um, and then he was like, what have you got on you? And they all kind of gathered around me. Um, and this was a li- something I've been a little bit pissed off about. is Because uh, I've filed the police report, so then obviously it goes in the press and everything. And they wrote that there was only one guy, so I'd like to clarify there was more than one guy. So, um, so he's like, what have you got on you? And I'm like, I don't have anything. And, uh, you know, they say stop fucking around and that kind of thing. So I have some cash in my pocket. So I said, I've got some cash. So I pull out some cash. He takes it from me. And then uh, I had, like, my headphone jack just sticking into my pocket. And he was like, what's that plugged into? I'm like, oh, God's sake, it's my phone. Uh, And I'm thinking, okay, this is really annoying. But, you know, I'll wipe it and get a new phone and whatever. And then uh, the guy's like, okay, unlock your phone. And uh, the other one, like, pulls his shirt up and he's got, like, a knife sticking in his in his pants. And um, I was like, shit. 
And I, I'm kind of thinking like, do I get, I just said like, I can't. Like, I'm sorry. I, I was like, mate, I, I can't unlock my phone. And then the guy's like, you've got 10 seconds to unlock your phone. He starts counting down. And I'm like, fuck, am I going to unlock my phone? Am I going to give him my phone? What's the deal? So then I try and give him my phone. And he's like, no, I need to unlock it. And I was like, I can't. And then there's a little pond behind them near where I live. And I, I thought about throwing it in the pond to just be like. And the lights changed and there was like two cars coming. And I just like felt an opportunity and I just sprinted, ran. Well, I ran into the road and I tried to stop a car. And obviously, madman runs into the road, tries to get in your car. You're not going to let him in. Uh, try and get in another car. Don't let me in. But now I'm slightly away from them because I'm in the street. And I think, like, I just burned, just turned down and ran back towards, like, the little village area near where I live. So I just kind of sprinted. But usually when I'm out walking, I'm wearing, like, running stuff. And this was the one night I'm wearing, like, corduroy flares and shoes. Uh, yeah, I just sprinted down down the thing, and, and I guess because they had some cash and stuff, they just ended up turning around. I mean, I went walking again the next day right. because for that exact reason, I just didn't want it to stop me walking. Like, I walk a lot of nights uh, when I'm home, and I really like it. I feel like it's, you know, something I just really enjoy. And uh, so so I went, and actually I had some friends with me the next time, but I've been going since, and I have like a, I have someone, I have like a night guard who comes to my house. Um, it's, it's weird, it's uncomfortable, I think. It's really weird, and a lot of the time you end up drawing more attention to yourself if you're walking through a city with like some big guy behind you, you know? I feel like a, a big way that it's changed is that back then, I feel like everyone kind of just felt like really grateful to be getting to make music as a job and i feel like it's just a lot more competitive now it was more competitive about like writing songs um like it's like feels a little more like a business for a lot of people i feel like back then you wrote a song for one reason and then if it went number one that was like amazing and maybe i'm wrong because i you know wasn't alive so i could be completely wrong but it doesn't feel like people were going Let's change this chorus a bit because then it can be like a number one. Obviously, it's changed a lot because of like streaming and everything like that. I think uh, a lot of the time now, like if you, I guess back then, if you loved someone's show or their music, you might go to the show and hang out and stuff. And now I guess there's there's just a lot of people like that feel involved a lot of the time. So if you're like, oh, I really like this song, then suddenly people are like, well, you guys should collaborate and get in the studio together. And and it becomes, sometimes it becomes like, it's not like an organic hangout. It becomes your kind of, you know, people trying to like put you together. So when it happens and it's like organic and you run into people and you get on and end up hanging out and if you play music or not, most of the time you probably don't. It's really nice. Um, I think like if there's stuff that I really want to do and it kind of sounds like, like I just really want to be involved in it, then I'd love to do it. I don't. I don't see myself like wanting to go get a movie because I have like a year off and I want something to do. But if, you know, when, when I heard about Dunkirk, it was like when I, I got it, they said, you know, don't take anything because we don't want it to be like actory. But I mean, it was good, I guess, because the character I was like a young soldier who didn't know what he was doing. It was kind of one of those things where like I learned the script, I learned what my lines were, but I never practiced them. I didn't like say them out loud. Yeah, I think someone had told me, like, just say the words as if it's the first time you're saying them. And I was like, I'm just going to make it the first time I'm saying them. I mean, I think you want to be, like, comfortable enough in case they make changes and stuff. I think a lot of the time when people, like, go over and over and over lines is you get stuck one way of saying stuff and you don't really know how to change it. So I kind of just tried to go at it as, like... It was also just the size of the set and I was a massive fan of Chris Nolan before. So... The whole thing was really intimidating. Like the first day on set, walk out and there's like some destroyer marine ship in the water. And I was like, is that for us? And they're like, yes. And I was like, oh, shit. It was really fun. Yeah. The thing with 
SNL was, I feel like, I used to get so nervous before everything, before we would do anything. And uh, to the point where, like, I used to be so nervous that I'd just, I'd almost always just be really disappointed with something because I just thought I was too nervous or my hand was shaking or something like that. And uh, SNL, I don't really know why. I think maybe just because so much of the time you go on a show and you sit backstage for three hours for three minutes and you go out and it's like okay every you know you finish the album now you're selling the album let's go this is the three minutes don't mess it up here we go and snl like you're there for the week you've rehearsed everything ultimately everything's written on the cards so like i mean they're all so amazing over there they're they're pretty great my my mom is like very chilled about the whole thing uh they just like get it I think it's it's difficult because so many people kind of have that, uh, you know, they have like pushy parents and that kind of thing, and they just kind of always stayed out of it. Um, you know, th those people have like looked after you your entire life and still now, and, uh, you know, especially with my mum, like I wouldn't be here if she hadn't put me in for the thing. And when I, when I moved to London for the show, she lent me some money to, you know, go and buy a bunch of clothes and stuff. Ben Ben was making a documentary with the band. I'd met him. We'd met a couple times. Like he tells the story of me asking to move in with him, and I I cannot believe that I would have the gall to ask him after only spending a couple of days with him. So I'm pretty sure he offered. But I was moving. I'd got a house in his area, like five minutes from his place, and I'd moved out of my last place. And I basically had like two weeks where I was you know, going to do some painting and stuff in the house. And the painting turned into, like, ripping the insides out. So I moved in for a planned two weeks, and I'd never met his wife. We met for, like, coffee just so I'd met her and stuff. And um, But when I moved in, they'd, they'd only just recently moved in. There was nothing really in the attic, so I just kind of took my mattress from my flat and threw it on the floor in the attic. And I had that for about... It was like nine months, and then eventually I got a bed. But um, it was probably the best move I ever made. I think I had, like, I'd moved away from my family. I had, like, some feeling of family. We never really talked about work. So I'd go and play, like, a show in Brazil and come home and just sit and watch TV with them. Like, I moved to London. You're kind of, I was in the band, we're traveling, and suddenly there's no rules. And even as simple as... They uh, they have, like, a kosher house. So I moved in. I didn't really get it. And the first week, I ordered, like, a pepperoni pizza. Right at the time when I, like, started going out in London and drinking and you could go into bars and, you know, little members clubs and get hammered and then go home. And I think so many of those parties in London, there's, like, that, there's like that 2 a.m. cutoff where half the party goes upstairs to do cocaine. And... You know, you're kind of like thrown into this thing and I'm, and you know, I'm kind of there and I'm like, well, I'm not going to, I don't know his wife well enough to go back like off my face. You know, it, it was, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. The biggest thing for me was probably when I moved to London and you start meeting all these new people and you meet other people in the industry and stuff. And the first thing I remember was it's like any dinner that I would go to or drinks thing like it's such a world of gossip as the world is but you know within the industry everybody loves to gossip and I just remember hearing so many stories about people being assholes and people like smashing shit and people throwing food and all of that shit and just people being weird to other people and I just remembered like how it made me think of the other of those people and I was like I really don't want anyone to tell a story like that about me mm. um I feel like I mean it, it's always kind of a, a balanced thing some of it because you want to you want to date normally but then you also want to protect it so that it can be normal like I think a, a good example is like you know if you want to go for dinner with someone New York's pretty busy 
And if you want to have like a quiet dinner, you maybe want to go like in the back door or something. But then that's not a normal date either. Yeah, I think I think ultimately anyone who's going to get it is going to understand that cuz I think a big part of it is like you want to you want to be able to spend enough time with each other where you can get to know each other before you have to deal with all of the extra stuff and you're kind of like solid enough in what this is. It's like okay, you know how I feel about you. I know how you feel about me. We're going to kind of we're already a relationship and then you add the stuff on the top rather than you go out for dinner with someone and it's like, oh, that's his, you know, that's his girlfriend or whatever. And you're like, well, it's not. And now it's weird because we're like, are we dating or are we not dating? Like, I, I try as hard as I can to keep the two worlds kind of would like to do, yeah. You know, open and people have different, like, things. But, yeah, I, I'd like to think I would want that at some point yeah no i th- th- i'm pretty lucky with them like i can't you know think i th- i feel like when you grow up and you understand a little more about relationships even then you kind of you know you you get it when you know about your parents getting divorced but ultimately i think whether they want to be together or not or you can really ask for is them to like support you and love you and i've always had that from both my parents well i got up this morning at five thirty. Um, you know, or I mean, I, you won't find me in bed past the crack of noon. No. Uh, yeah, but I kind of I go back and forth with go with doing it and just doing it in my phone a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, it felt so annoying. Like people, like friends, phone numbers and stuff. Nah, no. Um, yeah, a lot of voice notes. We we recorded a lot of the new album at um, Real World, which is Peter Gabriel's studio in, in England. Um, but we all got in there and we just wanted to blast Sledgehammer in the room so bad. And we were like, do you mind if we do it? Um, but I love it so much. The vi- The music video is one of my favorite videos of all time. I love it because, I, well, I think it's like the best mixed song ever. We kind of, I do a lot of writing with Mitch. Uh, we met, during the first album, when we were making the first album, um, this guy Ryan, who was engineering, um, was Mitch's roommate. And we had a guitarist who was supposed to come in. And Ryan was like, I can get Mitch to come in. So Mitch came in. And uh, he was just playing. We were writing together. And it was kind of like... Uh, so we met, yeah, 2010. Yeah. And then he was working kind of always. And we had a band while we were in while we were in One Direction. And then when we finished and we started thinking about when we'd finished the first album, we started putting the uh, band together. I called Adam and he'd just finished the tour. And I was like, what are you doing next year? And he said, nothing. And I was like, great. I don't I don't know if I could say it's something he shouldn't have done because I, I just didn't feel that way. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to like condemn it because I don't. The last thing that I would have wanted is for him to have stayed there if he didn't want to be there. Yeah, I think like it was a shame. It was a shame and like it was like in a tour. And I think if he'd come to us and maybe kind of discussed it a little more, we might have found a way to kind of do it a little smoother. But but ultimately, if you know, if you don't want to be there, then you don't want to be there. And I, you know, um, I think like I'd I'd been in the band since I was sixteen. And, you know, there was five of us and then we had like a lot of managers and we had a lot of people at the label and you kind of, you're, you're in these meetings and it's like, are we going to do another album? Yes. Are we going to do another tour? Yes. Are we going to do this, that and that? And every, and all of those decisions obviously affect your life in a massive way. And every decision I've made since I was 16 was as part of a group. And I kind of just felt like I needed to work out. I didn't necessarily know who I was as an adult. It was like I had to go off and if somebody says, do you want to go do this? And I'm like, what do we think? Or do I want to do that? And so it's a little difficult, I guess, when, when like, I think if you're just starting out fresh, you, you have the ability to, like, make a ton of mistakes and stuff. Right. Like, for example, if you're an actor who's just starting out, you can make a ton of bad movies and then... Uh, and then you make like your great movie and stuff. And I kind of, 
I definitely felt a little bit of like, I'm trying to work out what exactly my solo music sounds like, who I am a bit, and uh, and I don't really want to like start fucking it up kind of in front of people. Um, Sarah John, well, it's really it's Sarah's band because it's after every show it's either the first or second thing that people say show was great drummer's incredible uh so mitch starts going out with them and every night they'd tell me like oh mitch was crazy last night you know doing all this stuff and then uh and then i remember a couple nights i was like what did mitch do last night and they were like oh no we didn't see him oh i just got some dinner with sarah and then re- when we started rehearsing together he would play and then over the weeks, he would kind of just staring at each other the whole time we would play. Yeah. Uh, initial stages of infatuation with somebody. Pro- I mean, the common denominator would be me. Uh, 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 I th- well, I think Adore You is more about, like, it's more about that honeymoon period than the other part. I like, uh, like, I think, I think it's kind of like any relationship, you know, once you get past that stage, then the exciting part becomes that you're like a team. I mean, I can't say I've had like a lot of relationships, like proper relationships, but, um, you know, that that can be hard. Mm -hmm. I try and keep that, the fame thing, out of the relationship thing as much as possible. Well, we call sometimes. I thought about getting one in London and then, because I live in London, and for me, it was like I had a bit of a hard time getting out of my own way enough to go to therapy in the first place. And I felt like there was a big part of me that was like, oh, everybody, like everybody I know is in therapy. And I was like, I just don't think I need it. And I want to be the guy who didn't have to go to therapy. And then somebody just described it to me as like, you can tell somebody everything. You can talk at somebody and then you pay them and they're not allowed to tell anyone. But for me, like, it's much easier to have one person who is like a vessel who I can tell everything to. And I feel like if if I started having two different people, it would confuse me a bit. Yeah. Right. No, I think she, um, I mean, I think she's amazing. She like definitely, uh, I don't know. She like, mm, no, no. Yeah. Uh, this was, uh, I think like a day. I mean, we have, like, they have, like, different suits and, like, different colors and stuff. And, you know, we give a shit. Uh, The aforementioned mushrooms were in play. I jumped out a window. I was high. I don't know if I thought it would be cool. Um, I don't know. And uh, I hit my chin on my knee, and I bit, like, the end of my tongue off. Now, it was pretty painful, but um, it's okay now. Um, And sometimes... When I, like, if I'm really tired, I can feel my mouth get lazy and I get, like, a very small lisp and it's gone. Yes. I don't feel like it's chosen as much as who I want to give a break. It's more like I have to hear it every night. Weed makes me tired. And I don't like smoking. Um, I don't do it when I'm working or anything. I feel like, I feel like um, when I was a kid, there's, you know... You kind of dress, I mean, you're in uniform, and then when you're around friends, there's so much, like, pressure. Wear the cool thing or have the right shoes and that kind of thing. And I feel like I'm just, like, a lot more comfortable probably with myself now than I used to be. And it's kind of like, I don't know, that that looks fun. I'll kind of, and I think I didn't want to be a hypocrite. And if there's something that seems fun and I want to try it on, then um, I'll wear it. Don't really try not to... I guess with, like, clothing and stuff, I just try and not take it seriously. It's not like, it doesn't feel like performance. It's kind of one of those things where, um, you know, you, like, people are like, oh, we want you to be yourself, and then you do that kind of stuff, and people are like, the whole, like, trying to please everyone thing just doesn't work. It's like a, yeah, it's just like a storage unit, yeah. Okay. Ooh, let me think. Uh, no, I think we're good. There's not a lot of, like, interviews where I talk a lot about, like, personal stuff. For someone else to do that, uh, I think it's like a, you know, it's like flattering. Even if the song isn't that flattering, you've still spent time on it. And and ultimately, using Taylor as an example, she's a great songwriter. So, yeah. No, 